Yeah, so good morning DevOx Ukraine. I'm really excited to be here and to speak to you today. Yesterday was already a great day, um, lots of great talks, and I really enjoyed it to be able to, uh, to close the day yesterday with some uh, music and software. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about a bit more serious topic, but it can also be quite fun. So, so let's dive into it. Uh, first thing you need to know, I guess, is that this talk is hashtag slideless. So I didn't prepare any slides because the entire talk is one big demo, actually. Um, which is also very fun, um, and I really had some fun preparing it. Um, so the talk is called 11 Crazy Things I Didn't Know You Could Do With Java Until I Got My Java 11 Certification, as you can see on the screen. Um, and here's how to reach me, if you if you want to reach me. Um, so um, I, I'm working as an IT consultant at InfoSupport, which is a IT company uh, in the Netherlands. And um, last summer, uh, my employer actually asked me, Hanno, would you be open to um, to getting your Java 11 certification? And I said, well, um, is this really necessary? You know, I've been a, been a Java developer for over 14 years, so I guess I, guess I know Java pretty well. Um, and I, I had actually achieved uh, a Java certification quite early in my career, which was for Java 5, so quite an ancient version. Uh, so I said, what, what, what good would it do me, you know, to get this certification? And my employer said, well, um, we are, um, we are do doing a bit on a project with a, with a, with a customer. And it was, um, it was a bit on, um, on some work regarding uh, Java training. So, um, there's a, a customer who wanted a supplier for delivering Java trainings for, uh, for a period of four years. And one of their, um, one of their, um, demands was actually the trainers that you provide need to be certified for the latest java version so that was the incentive uh, coming from my employer and i said well yeah i can give it a try you know I'm, I'm i don't think it will have many secrets anymore for me so i just thought i'll study for this exam and i'll, I'll pass it uh, no problem and it turned out i was quite wrong <laughs> i mean there were quite a few new APIs that I that you had to learn by heart, so I spent a lot of time on time on that. Uh, but mostly, there were quite a few things in the actual Java language that I didn't know by heart. Um, and so I thought, um, when I, while I was studying for the test, let's just keep track of the things that I, that surprised me, uh, so that I could um, rehearse them for myself. And um, after passing the test and getting my certification, I thought. I'll, I'm going to put them in the talk. So I've chosen the 11 craziest things, according to me, that I learned during studying for the Java 11 certification. So 11 things that I didn't know were possible with Java, even though I had used Java for 14 years. Well, this can mean actually two things. It can mean that, uh, first, I've been a lousy developer for the past 14 years, haven't paid any attention at all to anything whatsoever. So I need to do a quick you know, sanity check. Is this actually the line of work I should be in? Or it could mean that actually these are 11 things that are a bit crazier or are a bit less known, and you don't learn about them in your regular work. You just learn about them when you're studying for certification. Now, either way, it's going to be a fun talk because either way you can conclude Hanno is a crazy Java developer and he had to learn much more than what he has done until now. Or you could learn a few things that you wouldn't come across in the wild, uh, but uh, can learn about because you're attending this talk right now. So actually, I'm giving you all the chance to learn 11 crazy things in 20 minutes that took me over 14 years to learn. So you'll be like 400,000 times quicker than me if you're able to rem remember them all. So uh, that's a that's a win win, I guess. So the structure of the talk is quite simple. I've prepared 11 test classes and most of them are failing. Some are not, but I'll, I'll get to that. 11 test classes and actually to be able to learn these 11 crazy things, we're just going to make sure that these tests are all passing by the time we end the talk. So uh, no pressure, uh, but we're still going to do it. And um, I'm just going to start at number number 11. And number 11 is, um, is a, a scenario that are a few freaky ways to declare and initialize arrays, which is right here. So 
I've created two test methods here and both of them are failing. And let's see why they are failing. So in this case, we are expecting an array, an int array of length two to be returned. So let's dive into this production method and see why it's not um, why it's not succeeding. Well, it's not succeeding because it, as it turns out right now, it returns null. So that's not, not what we want. Uh, we want to make sure that it returns an int array of length two. So let's remove this line and uncomment this one. And um, this example shows that when you are using local type variable inference with the keyword var, you can't combine that with an array. And this is what I have tried this before and it, it didn't work out. So uh, what you actually need to do is remove these brackets. And now it is an int array of size two. So no brackets right here. They should be right there. And then it's an inner int array of type of size two with local type variable inference uh, enabled. Moving on, C style arrays. So Java has supported this from the start, I guess, that you can, can say, I want an int array, but I, I'm calling it int at the beginning and I'm providing the brackets after the variable name like this. Now, um, this one also needs to return an array. Um, well, actually a list of two arrays to make sure that it passes. So let's, let's put it here and let's uncomment this one. And then we come across the situation that array two, array two actually is not an array, but it has become an int. And that is because this is the variable type and it is repeated, of course, if you separate uh, more fields with commas here. But this array declaration, C style declaration, doesn't transfer to the second one. So you need to make sure that it is embedded in the data type right here. And if you do that, you will ret you will return the right list of int arrays. And this assertion should uh, actually succeed. What I'm going to do in between examples is run the code in the background, uh, the test in the background, and move on to the next one because I don't have time to wait for the test results. And at the end, I'll just have a quick look to see whether all tests uh, have succeeded. So that's what I'm going to do. Open example number 10 and run the test in the background. So number 10 is about stream elements that don't implement comparable but must be sorted anyway. They can cause very unexpected behavior. Um, so here is our, our test method. And what we are doing here is sorting a, a, a list of talks, a set of talks. Um, so I'll, I'll show you the uh, production code right here. So we've created a stream of talks, just a basic data object with a few speakers, Bugs Bunny, Roadrunner, Tweety. They're all talking about topics they are find very important, like Tweety is talking about banning all cats of the internet with uh, some timestamps so that the, the local times that uh, the talks are starting. And if you call sort it on any stream like this, it tries to sort the stream, of course, and, and collect it in a certain way if you, uh, if you uh, add collect to it and put it in a new tree set. But in order for sorted to work, these object instances need to be comparable. And if they are not, in this case, they're not, this is the error that you're getting, class cast exception. The class cannot be cast to comparable, which is quite a cryptic message, actually, um, because actually this means that you're trying to call sorted on a set of objects that are not comparable yet. I had no idea. So when I first saw, when I got this question on one of the practice exams, I thought, surely this will not compile, but it compiles no problem. And you just get a runtime class cast exception. So how do you solve this? Well, actually you make your, um, your data object implement comparable of the generic type talk right here. And that means that you have to implement the compare to method. Um, oops, like this implement methods compare to, and let's just return uh, a comparison of a speaker, for example. So that's sorted by speaker name. There we go. So that will fix this issue actually. And what, now when you get this error, you will know that it, it will have something to do with sorting uh, stream elements that are not comparable. So you should make them implement comparable. Okay, number nine. And number nine is about accessing static interface methods, which is a lot harder than you might think, but it, because it sounds very simple, but actually it's not. So um, I've again created a talk, this time by Bugs Bunny at 11 o'clock. 
And I want to assert that the length of this talk is equal to 50 minutes in this case. Um, so um, how do we how do we go about this? Well, actually, this length in minutes is not a field of the talk, but it's actually a field of an interface. I've, I've defined a slot interface. It has a, a static field length in minutes equal to 50. It also has a static interface method called length description and the class talk now implements the slot interface. So I can access from a talk instance the length in minutes field and the length description uh, method. Or can I? Because when I was studying for the test or before I studied for the test, actually, I was quite sure that something like this would be possible. So just provide a talk instance and um, refer to the static field. Well, that compiles no problem. But if I get a talk instance and get a reference to the static method, compilation fails. Which is quite bizarre, I think, because if you would define a static method on, for example, a superclass, you can um, call it from a subclass instance, no problem. But when it's defined in an interface, the compiler says static method may be invoked on containing interface only. So not even like this. So you can't even provide a class name. You actually have to provide the interface name like that, and then it compiles. I had no idea. So the first questions on this topic, I failed miserably in the practice exams, mind you. So in the in the, in the actual exam, it, it worked out quite well. Yes. And number eight is about creating anonymous subclasses in an enum definition. Because yes, you can. And I didn't know that, but you can. So I've created an enum that is about um, that is about uh, DevOps, uh, the DevOps conference. I saw, I saw, um, I saw an assertion here that I forgot to update because DevOps is in Ukraine right now, not in Belgium. Uh, but anyway, um, so this enum is quite simple. It's a conference enum, and it just has a few uh, a com uh, a conference codes. So Oracle Code One, JFOL, which is a Dutch conference, and uh, DevOps, which is in Ukraine, of course. Current edition is 2021, but the next one will be 2022. Um, and um, we just store the name of the conference, the year of the next edition, and the country where, where it takes place, right? And there is a, a string method. When is the next that just returns a string value that tells you the next specific conference will be in this country and it will be uh, will be in this year, sorry, and will, it will take place in this country. But the um, the assertions are currently failing. And one of the reasons is that JFOL, which is the conference in my home country, is actually a one-day conference. And it has been characterized by many people as the best one-day conference they know, um, which I'm very proud of because it's in my country, of course. And um, currently, this method is not providing this extra string message. And I can make sure that it does by creating an anonymous subclass here. The first. They, I saw this in a practice exam um, question. I lost my mind because I had no idea that you could do this. So just after the enum declaration, you can say overwrite the when is the next method and provide a new implementation. And we actually have to append a string. I'm just going to copy it because otherwise I will make terrible typos like this. And we can just call the super implementation, which is this one, of course, this one, and then add a specific message for this conference, which will make the assertion succeed. Moving on to number seven, division by zero. I always thought division by zero was not possible and would cause arithmetic exceptions. And in some cases they do, but not in all cases. So when you're dividing an int by an int, which is what I'm doing right here, dividing uh, 42 by zero in this method right here, dividing int by int, it actually throws an arithmetic exception. You can see by the green icon that this assertion is succeeding. It throws an arithmetic exception and there is a method division by zero. But when I try to do the same with a float arguments, so here are float literals, we're calling the float um, overload of this method, then actually no exception has, is being thrown, which is also indicated by uh, this assertion error didn't raise a throwable. So that means that this division actually succeeds or something. And when I looked into it, it turned it actually turned out that um, 
uh, this invocation doesn't uh, throw any exception, but it returns a float constant. Um, and the float constant is called positive infinity. So there is an infinity constant for division by zero, which is, equal, which is present in both the float class and in the double class, actually. So I've got a, I've got a double test method here also. Okay. Just change the assertion here. Um, and divide double in this case also returns a positive infinity a static variable, static result. So that behaves a little differently than I thought, actually. Moving on to number six, method overloading priorities. They are all over the place. They are just not what you would expect. So I've created a class with a method print sum, and there are actually a few um, there are actually a few overloads of them uh, with integer box. So box integers, double primitives, and an int var args array. And if I would just run this main method here, as you see right now, with the int literals, what would you think actually would happen? So the first time I looked into this, I thought probably, yeah, probably, probably the, the int var args array, right? Because it's, it's the same data type. And surely it will, it will, it will call the, the int var args array. So, and we can, of course, try it out right now by running the main method. And based on the output, we have to conclude that it calls the double overload instead of the int var args. Um, and this is because method overloading priorities uh, is widening first. So the first thing that Java tries to do when it doesn't find an exact match for int a, int b, it, it will try to widen the variable. And then it, it, come, it, it arrives at the double overload. Um, so that makes me think, what if the double overload simply wasn't there? What would happen then? Well, widening is not possible anymore. So now it would try to box the primitives. So in this case, the integer overload is being called. And of course, you know, just to be uh, just to be complete here, in this case, it doesn't have any choice but to use the int var args one. So the priority is actually widening, and after widening, boxing, and after boxing, using var arc overloads. I just have to undo this a bit so to make sure that uh, that my te my test uh, assertions are uh, working again, and call the the entire test suite again. Um, and this means that we have to um, simply delete the, the assertion methods that are, that are asserting the wrong thing. So it should print in do, uh, double, actually. So print some double is the one that we have to maintain. The other two just can be thrown away. Also, also, also a way to make sure your test succeeds, of course. Well, if their assertions are wrong, then, uh, then that's no problem. Ooh. Don't need that. So let's move on to number five. And this is about talk ratings. Talk ratings. So um, I have created a method that uh, generates a description of a talk rating. And talk ratings in this case are done by uh, assigning uh, the character A, B, C, or D. So A is a great talk, and B is a good talk, C or D is average talk, and everything else. So E, F, G are all very bad talks. Uh, so it just it just returns this uh, this string value right here, and I've created a parameterized test right here. I think you saw it already. Oh, it's right here. So when I provide A it should be great talk, B should be a good talk, C and D average, E and F bad talk. But when I run it, I've run it of course before. C and D actually yield bad talk instead of average talk, which is not what, what I was expecting at all. Uh, and um, the exam question uh, really fooled me this time because you could argue that this looks like an or statement or something. But uh, when you think about it a bit further, of course, this is not the way that you handle two cases in a switch statement. Actually, what's happening here is this is a bitwise operator. And Java is just performing, applying this bitwise operator to the integer values of C and D. Now, what are the integer values of C and D? Well, actually, C is equal to 99 in an integer representation, which is this binary uh, representation. D is equal to 100. So if we're doing bitwise OR, which actually means 
if there's a one, turn it into a one. If there are both zeros, turn it into a zero. Then you get this binary representation, which is equal to the integer 103, which is equal to the character G. So <laughs> actually, this says case, case G instead of case C or D, which is why um, our searches were failing, because it, what, it, it went to the default range. So if we would just solve this properly by using a fall through, then it would of course, succeed the tests. Moving on to number four, talk array should equal a cloned, cloned talks array. So I've created a talks array, the same talk, uh, talk object that we had before. Actually, these are some tips for talks to, to, uh, to attend later today. Two talks that I thought were very interesting. So by Victor and Dea, a clean pragmatic architecture and by Kai Royce, understanding probabilistic data structures with a lot of UFO signing, sightings. Um, it's, of course, it's not about the content for this talk, um, just some free advice um, to, uh, for your conference schedule. But what I'm actually testing here is that there's a getter that just returns this talks array, and there's a, a get clone talks that returns a clone of the talks array. And um, the exam questions that handled this were really about, OK, is a clone array actually double equals equal to the original one? And at first I thought, well, it must be, but it's not, of course, because a clone is a new object. So an, another, another occupies another space on the Java heap. So it can't be the same object ever again. So we just have to make sure that this assertion uh, expects false. But after that, is it possible that the talks are contained in the clone talk? So at first I thought it, it's not possible because it's not the same array instance. So why would uh, why would the content of the, the arrays actually be the same? But as it turns out, the clone operation on an array is actually a shallow clone. So it clones, it clones um, the accompanying object, but not uh, the inside of the array. So actually, this should succeed because it's a shallow clone. Only the array object is cloned and gets a different object representation, but the content stays the same. They stay in the same place of the heap, so they are just um, the same references as in the original. Moving on to wrapper objects, because some are more equal than others. Um, so just for sanity, here is, a, here is an assertion that says if I, if I do an integer equals, this is just a static method that does the double equal comparison. So if it's the same instance. So 200 if, is, of course, not the same instance as 300. So is it, the assertion should be false, and it is. Um, but all wrapper objects are immutable. So that's also something that you need to keep in mind. Um, so uh, if you're passing both 200s uh, in this case, it is also false because um, because of uh, because of, of, of we, we are we are comparing integers here. So these int literals are being boxed. So two separate integer objects are created. So they are not equal. However, if you pass integer literals uh, with value of 10. They are equal again. You see, this, this assertion is failing right here. And I thought that was really bizarre until I learned that Java reuses wrapper objects to save on memory. And in the in case of integer, uh, all, all wrapper objects between these lower and upper bounds are reused, so cached in a way, to make sure that uh, because they are used quite a lot so to, uh, to save on memory. So when it is between these bounds, they need to be true again. So the equals need to be true again. And if you want to uh, circumvent this, uh, this mechanism, just like with a string interning, for example, you can um, create a new integer with the constructor, which is deprecated, by the way. Uh, but this will make sure that, um, that they are different again. So this assertion actually should be false. Is false. Moving on to number two, which is about functional interfaces. We're getting there, we're getting there. So this test actually doesn't assert anything because we can't, we can't really assert on anything, but we can go to the definition of these functional interfaces. Uh, a lot of questions on the exam are about what is a functional interface? And I just thought it has to have one single abstract method and then it's a functional interface. But it turns out that's not really the case. So this is the classic functional interface for you. Um, Oh, actually this one, because it needs to be an interface. So just, this was just for sanity. It can't be an abstract class with one abstract method. It should be actually an interface. 
Um, but it can also have a default void in addition. That's not a problem because there's there's still one there's still one abstract one. So um, what if you would extend it? Well, that's not really a problem. Um, um, or is it? Because if you extend it and add another abstract method, well, in that case, it's not a functional interface anymore. Um, because you, you have two abstract methods right there. So that's not really, not re not really what you want. And um, the final thing that I wanted to show you is um, you can actually have multiple abstract methods in a functional interface when they are um, when they are overridden from their superclass or in this case the equals and the two string methods are from the object class so you can really override them uh, and make them abstract again and then this is the abstract method that is implemented by your lambda expression i see i'm running out of time um, so the final uh, final example can't really can't really show you but it's about how you would call method references with parameters um, maybe I'll tweet about it on my on my Twitter profile, so you still have that demo. Also, uh, let me get to uh, my final slide. Well, it's not a slide; it's a readme, of course. Um, all the demos that I showed you today are available on my GitHub. So, if you would follow the link that's right here, you can see that um, the code is all right there. Uh, also, if you want to know a bit more about me, there's my website. I will also tweet uh, on this Twitter handle about the the GitHub code. Um, so you can you can view it right there and, uh, and see the examples for yourself. Um, and to summarize, it's really worth getting a Java 11 certification because you will learn lots of stuff even when you have been coding Java for 14 years. Thanks for your attention, DevOps Ukraine, and have a great day. Thank you, Hannah. I think you can continue discussing the Java certification in our discussion room. I hope our participants have a lot of questions. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you.